And the answer is already there. People are certain that they're going to be okay. But even Bilam, the wicked, is telling you, Oi, who's even going to be survive? Who's even going to survive this end of times? At the same time, Bilam gives a deathly advice to Balak. He says, since my strategy of cursing Amisa did not work, let me give you something else. In Gemara Masechet Sanhedrin, page 106a, It says that Bilam, they describe this entire event in a dialogue between Bilam and Balak. And Bilam gives the deathly advice that nearly destroyed our nation. By saying to, Bil to Balak, you don't need me to curse them. If you want to destroy them, you don't even need weapons. What do you need? No. Znut. Immodesty. Why? Because the God of these people hates immodesty. Elohim sonezima. Chapter 25, verse 1. וישב ישראל בשיטים ויחל העם לזנות אל בנות מואב ותקרנה לעם לזבחי אלוהן ויוכל העם וישתחוו לאלוהן ויצמד ישראל לבעל פאור ויחר אף אדוני בישראל Israel settled in the שיטים and the people began to commit harlotry with the daughters of Moab the nation of Balak, both his nation of Moab and his neighboring nation, Midian, send their girls with mini skirts and tank tops to the camp of Israel. You think I'm joking? Balak, Balak is three letters in the Hebrew alphabet. Bet, Lamed, Kuf stands for Bnot, Lechu, Katsar. Girls go with shorts. Bilam, Bet, Lamed, Ein, Mem stands for Bnot, Lechu, Imini. <laughs> Girls go with mini, mini skirts. Do you think it's a coincidence? Did he know what about those mini skirts back when they were to turn off? What do you think? Harlotry and uh, prostitution was created now? They didn't have mini skirts. Everyone was mad. It's given the queen. Not here. Specifically, he's telling you there's znut. Znut specifically means immodesty, specifically means promiscuity. They're going chasing men. Why? get them to sin so the men thinking oh wow they're so nice maybe they want peace maybe the goyot want peace the non-jews want peace they get them all hot and Chazal says in the same Gemara Masechet, so, uh, Masechet Sanhedrin they get them all hot and then they tell them listen if you want me they pull out an idol and they say bow to this yeah. bow to this idol And they bowed. And they bowed. Hashem said to Moses, take all the leaders of the people and hang them before Hashem against the sun. Hashem gives instructions to go hang people. 
Chazal says that on one end, one of the Pirushim says that when he says take all the leaders of the people, meaning arrange witnesses, arrange the leaders of Am Yisrael to witness these people sinning and hang them on the spot because you need witnesses. You can't just say, listen, this guy sinned three weeks ago. But Echidush, where technically the way it's written, it actually doesn't say that. It's one sentence. It actually says, "Vayomer Adonai Moshe kach et kol reshe ha'am ve'oka otam." It actually says, "Take all the leaders of the people and hang them. Hang the leaders." <clears throat> this is the third time in four weeks. Hashem is telling us to kill the leaders, or He kills them Himself. Why? We have a serious mitzvah. We refuse to follow. Just like you're not allowed to eat pig, it's a mitzvah. You have to lay tefillin, mitzvah. You have to believe in God, mitzvah. Keep Shabbat, mitzvah. Modesty, mitzvah. Ocheach, tochiach et amitecha. You must rebuke your people, mitzvah. Leaders are seeing Am Yisrael sinning and saying nothing. Politically correct. Politically correct. We don't want to hurt their feelings. Her mini skirt's very nice. Maybe she's going to change. Maybe she's going to become more modest over time. Maybe she's going to convert. The Maharal from Prague, Maharal from Prague, wrote in his book, Gvurot Hashem. Maharal from Prague, just so you know, it's a famous story. Some people believe it's a myth, but the people of that town have a museum based on the story. Maharal from Prague created a golem. Mm -hmm. Created a being from nothing, from, from uh, clay. Kabbalistic stuff. He yeah, he used Kabbalah, used his knowledge in order to protect the Jews because the Goyim kept coming in and um, the Jews. Uh, kidnapping women. Kidnapping women, keeping, ki kidnapping the Jewish women. So the Maral created a golem, which from there I think the story of Frankenstein comes. Um, to protect. And then as soon as there was no more reason for it, he told them to stop operating. But anyway, whether the story is true or it's a myth is irrelevant. The point being is that they don't tell stories about you or me, that we created golems. He was a holy, holy person. In his book, Vuat Hashem, chapter 60, he says the main thing for which a woman is praised and the highest madriga that she can reach, the highest level, that she can reach is based on her modesty. A woman without modesty cannot pass a test. The Igeret Agra, Vilna Gaon, wrote a letter to his mother. He says, My beloved mother, I know that you don't need my Musal. Meaning all the teaching that can teach you, you don't need it. Why? For I know that you are modest. We Meaning that modest. all the teaching you can teach a woman, she could go to Shuret Torah for 25 years. And do Tilot, and then she reads the whole Tilim 80 times a day. And she reads this one and that one, and she has Zgulot and candles, and all these great things. She's not modest? She can't pass a test. Can't pass a test. They call her wicked. That's Noah for the Tzaddik. Maram, page 2. It says, each person, each man gets a wife based on his actions. Rashi explains, a Tzaddik gets a modest woman and a wicked man gets a Putza, gets an immodest woman. Why isn't it 
a tzaddik, meaning a righteous person gets a righteous woman, and a wicked person, wicked man, gets a wicked woman. Why is a tzaddik connected to a modest woman? And a rasha, a wicked person, connected to an immodest woman. Why? What's the connection? Rashi explains, there is, if a woman is modest, she's already has an opportunity and has an ability to be righteous. But if a woman is not modest, it's impossible for her to be righteous. She could do all the tailim in the world. She could give tzedakah like Bill Gates. She'll have chesed. But as far as being considered tzedakah, impossible. Impossible. This is Gemara Masechet Sota, page 2. The whole Gemara, Masechet Sota, is based on the laws of Kisui Rosh, really. And it's based on the laws of Shlom Bait. And it's based on honesty and a lot of different things that you learn. But all of that comes from the Torah Parashat Naso. In Parashat Naso, there's a section that they call Parashat Sota. And it's a Sota is a wayward woman. Meaning a woman that's suspected of cheating on her husband, Hashem Echem. If a husband suspected that his wife cheated on him, in those days, he didn't have to hire a private investigator. If he saw her acting in a... Uh, you have to hire cheaters. In a... Uh, way that she's not allowed, she was, saw her close herself in a room with someone she's not allowed to be with, with another man that's not him, and he would warn her. If she still didn't follow, then he would, and she would do it again, he'd bring witnesses and they would see it. And then if she's in a closed room, he could suspect that she cheated on him. And he would take her to the Kohen Agadol, the most holy man of the entire nation, in the Beit Mikdash, and the Kohen Gadol would go through this process of trying to convince her to admit that she cheated on her husband if she cheated. Why? Because if she denies it, then, he, then she'll have to drink the bitter water. The bitter water has the water that was used to wash and purify the hands and feet of the Kohanim. And also... The uh, Kohanim would write the real name of Hashem, the Shem of Eforash, as Tzaddik said, and they would actually put the, uh, it would be on a uh, scroll, and they would put this inside the water so the ink would actually be erased, the, the name of Hashem would be erased, and the ink would be mixed up with the water. <clears throat> and this is actually showing us that, you know, obviously it's a sin to erase Hashem's name. But Hashem made this mitzvah. Shlom. How could it be? Hashem says for Shlom Bait, to make peace in the home, to prove that the wife didn't cheat, you're even allowed to erase my name. So Shlom Bait is very important to Hashem. And anyone that wants to learn more about this mitzvah, you should watch this year we did about Parashat Nasol, this year and last year. But anyway... If she drinks the water and she lied this whole time, she really did cheat on her husband. And she's lying, she doesn't want to admit it. And she drinks this water, she dies instantly. Her stomach blows up. It's a very, very disturbing death. And there's even a story in a Gemara, the two twins, women that were twins, actually tried fooling Hashem. What they did, one of them actually did cheat. 
But she said to the test, you go. The sister that didn't cheat, didn't do anything. You go and they'll think it's me. And that way at least I'm not going to die. But if I tell him that I did cheat, then my husband's going to kill me anyway. If I don't tell him and I drink this water, I'm going to die. So either way I lose. So why don't you go for me? Should have thought better before she cheated. She sends her sister. The sister drinks the water. Sees nothing happening. She comes home. She sees that her sister blew up. It's not the water that kills. But the queen has to check her here too. To go it's the sin that kills. It's God that kills. The same story has a similar story in the Gemara. I believe it's uh, Rabbi Hanina Ben Tardion. There was one time a snake in town and everybody was scared of the snake. It was killing people left and right. Very vicious snake killing people. They tell the rabbi, what should we do about the snake? The rabbi gets up, looks for the snake, finds the snake, takes his foot and smashes the snake. The snake is biting him in the leg as he's smashing him. And the rabbi doesn't feel anything, he's just smashing his head until he kills him. But the snake during this time has bitten the rabbi several times. But the rabbi walks around, nothing happened. People ask, what the half? Snake bit you. How are you not dead? He says, oh, the snake doesn't kill. Sin kills. Meaning, if Hashem is happy with you, nothing can touch you. If Hashem is unhappy with you, everything touches you. Whether it's a snake, or it's a fly, or it's just a cookie, everything touches you. So now, the Kohen would try to convince this woman to admit. He knows it's a hard thing to admit. She tries to tire her out, speak to her, intimidate her, intimidate her. But then the last step is to embarrass her. How to embarrass her? By pulling off the scarf from her hair. There's no wi wigs. There's no wigs in the Bet HaMikdash. No wigs. There's no, uh, you know, Organization that said, no, no, wigs are good. We're even selling them. We're having a, uh, a fair twice a year where you could sell the wigs in the Bet Knesset. There was no such thing in the Bet the Mikdash. No $5,000 wigs. No uh, $500,000 wigs. There's nothing. There's no wigs. Why? It was Kisui Rosh, hat, or scarf. And a Kohen Agadol would take this woman that's been suspected of being a Zona being a harlot, being promiscuous, sleeping with someone that's not our husband, and he would embarrass her and take off her kisui rosh. And if she still didn't admit, she would drink the water. And some couldn't admit and would die. But why am I telling you this story? I've told this story many, many times about what happens if to the Sotah. If they admit, do they still kill them? If they admit, no. If they admit, they just divorce the husband. They're not allowed to be with the husband anymore. They're also not allowed to be with the person that they cheated on the husband with. Meaning they have to lose in both ways. But either way, they live. The husband is not allowed to kill them. But I've told this story many times. It's in Parashat Naso. It's in Masechet Sota. There's no chidush here. What's the chidush? It may be that I heard this from uh, Rav Nisim Yagin. Or maybe that I read it somewhere. I don't remember the source. But it wasn't original. But I thought to myself... This sota, this woman, this wayward woman, 
The whole world is looking at her as until proven innocent, she's guilty. And the ultimate culmination of this act of putting herself in a situation, it's not that she's just an innocent victim and they're picking on her. She put herself in that situation. She did things that were wrong anyway. Maybe she didn't sleep with the guy, but she definitely think, did things that were wrong by embarrassing her husband, by being with another man in a closed room several times. She deserves what she's getting, even the embarrassment. Maybe she doesn't deserve death because she didn't sleep with the guy. But even if she did what she did, she still deserves the embarrassment. But nonetheless, the Torah has a specific name for her. The Gemara has a specific tractate for her. There's an enormous amount of teachings about Sota. It's mentioned in several Gemarot. She's not viewed in a positive light. Let's say that. And the culmination of this negative event is taking off her kisui rosh to embarrass her. So think about this. Instead of looking like Sarai Imenu, instead of looking like Hannah, instead of looking like Ruth, Instead of looking like Bathsheba, what do women today want to do? They want to look like the sota. Either because they don't want to cover their hair, or they want to wear a wig so it doesn't look like they're covering their hair. That's how far we are from Hashem. And when you think about that, if it doesn't bother your heart a little bit, you should question your Judaism. You guys ever heard the story of Sulika? Yeah, with the pins and she pinned herself. You heard every story. I can't give you any chidushim. <laughs> when I ask these questions, it's not for you. In Morocco, it's a true story. In Morocco, there were times that there was a lot of anti-Semitism and they would want us to marry them. And the Moroccans were very, very strong with religion very strong, close to Hashem, and sacrificed their life for Hashem. And there was a woman named Sulika that the prince wanted to marry her. I says, I can't. I cannot marry you. I'm Jewish and you're not. Under no condition will I let you marry me. After several requests, she refused. The prince got embarrassed, or the king got embarrassed. It says, okay. We're either going to force her to marry me by torture or we're going to make sure that she's the only one that's embarrassed. We're going to take her by the hair and tie her hair to the tail of the horse and drag her across the town until she says, stop, I want to marry him or she dies. When the whole city sees that no one goes against the king. And that's what they did. And before they told the horse to keep go, to go, said, do you have any last requests? And she says, yes. I would like to get needles. Pins. Pins. I'm asking, pins? Yes, I'd like to get pins. So they gave her a bunch of pins, laughing at this woman. I mean, usually people ask as a last request, they'll ask for a stake, they'll ask for mercy, they'll ask for another chance, they'll ask for all types of things, but pins? This was the first. And Sulika the Tzadika takes the pins and takes her dress and she puts the pins through the dress and through her skin to make sure that it doesn't ever show her immodesty. She's doesn't show any part of her body while she's being dragged by a horse. 
people are seeing this crazy woman, according to them crazy, according to us, one of the biggest tzaddikot that ever lived. Blood everywhere. All she cares about is that no one sees her knees. She wants to make sure that the dress is covering every part of her body. And definitely her knees. Regardless of the fact that she really is a nusa. She doesn't have to do that. But the modesty is already part of her. Why? Because modesty for a woman is the key to connection with Hashem. Key. Modesty in prayer. And so they do it. And they go. And they drag Sulika. And after a few moments, she screams, Stop! So everyone thinks, Oh, okay. She came back to her senses. She doesn't want to be continued dragging and blood everywhere. So they stopped the horse. They said, okay, you ready to marry the uh, king? He says, no, absolutely not. Chas v'shalom. So why did you say stop? I had to fix the pins and put them even deeper. And they dragged her until she died. The Rashash. Rashash. Rabbi Shalom Sharabi. The Yemenite king wanted to marry his daughter, but he respected the Rashash. Rashash said, Absolutely not. You can never marry my daughter. We are from two different nations. It can never be. He says, But I'm the king. I can do whatever I want. He says, Yes, but it can never be. But I'm the king, but I can do whatever I want. He says, Yes, but the Creator will never let it happen. And the king says, Let me show you. And they forced this poor daughter of Lashash to get dressed and get ready to marry the Gentile king. And as soon as she walked into the hall, the first step into the hall, she fell down and died. True story. It wasn't her fault, though. No. And Lashash comes to the king and he says, I told you. God will never let it happen. When you talk about modesty in this generation, people think that as long as you wear a skirt and you cover your elbows, you're considered modest. Well, there's a letter from the um, Rav Kanievsky that I read. And it's publicly available for anyone that wants it. And him alongside all of the Gdolei Adol. Not one or two, but the giants of the generation write a very, very terrifying letter that does not leave doubts for what modesty is you know a lot of women come to me and they say yeah but uh, you know each person at his level every person at his level you know there's levels of modesty that's complete hogwash it's complete nonsense there's no such thing as levels it's either you're modest or you're not modest yes once you're modest there's levels of modesty, but there's no such thing as, you know, some a short skirt that's modest. There's modest or not modest, and then you can become even more modest than the standard modest. But nonetheless, for anyone who doubts what modesty is, Dagon, Rav Moshe Feinstein wrote it. He says, the subject of tzniut for women is from a deoraita, meaning it's a biblical mitzvah. It's from Hashem directly. Lately, the urge for pritzut, for immodesty, has found its way even into the homes of the Shomre Torah, 
even into the religious people's homes. Luring them into wearing short garments. Rahmana He says, Hashem help us. People are wearing short skirts where the skirt is not covering the knee or it's barely covering the knee or as soon as they sit down it's no longer covering the knee. And this is what he continues in his letter. I have come to publicly proclaim that this is one of the most serious averot in the Torah. He's not calling it chet. He's calling it avera. There's a difference. A chet is not intentional. Shogeg, accidental. He's calling this avera. Avera means it's intentional sin. Everyone knows whether you're Jew or Gentile. Everyone knows what's modest and what's not modest. No one can go to Shemaim and say, no, no, I didn't know what modesty is. I thought that if I wear my tank top that I got from Polo and my shorts that I got from Donna Karen, I thought that would be modest. No woman that shows her skin thinks she's modest. She could be the, the stupidest woman on earth. She still knows what modesty is. That's why Rabbi Moshe Feinstein, Gdol Adol, is saying it's avera, it's an intentional sin. Why? Because you know. You know what modesty is and you're choosing not to be modest. He continues, those who transgress it, meaning that tr become, are immodest, will be severely punished, while those who do not give into the urge will be richly rewarded both in this world and the next. It is an obligation of the Bat Israel to wear kosher clothes, which do not allow even the most minimal part of her knee to show. As I've said this in lectures many, many times, this is not my rules, this is alakha. He's saying not even to show a small part of your knee, not even the shape of your knee is allowed to show, even after you sit down. Whether at the time of walking or when she sits down. So you see, I'm not making this up. He's, this is in his letter. Even here, this is the part that was a chidush. This is what he writes. Even if she wears thick hosiery, it is still forbidden because it is an immense pritzut to show the shape of the knee even when no flesh can be seen. All the more so when sheer hosiery is worn through which the flesh can be seen and the covering is therefore reckoned as non-existent. Meaning that even those religious women in Brooklyn who call themselves religious but they wear the short skirt but they feel that it's okay because they're wearing the thick stockings, black stockings. Yeah, see that According to Rabbi Moshe Feinstein, which everyone accepts him, Ashkenazi, Sephardic, everyone knows who he is. This is one of the Says it's not allowed. Complete pritzut, he calls it. It is the duty of each and every man to supervise the members of his family regarding the halacha against wearing short garments. They will then fulfill the verse of Vehi Mechanecha Kadosh. Meaning, may your uh, home be holy and will be worthy of having upright and blessed children who engage in the study of Torah and the fulfillment of mitzvot. We turn to the heads of the educational institutions for girls and request of them to be strong in this difficult struggle and not to allow pupils to wear short garments. In the merit of Tzniut and Kedushat Israel, may we soon merit the redemption. And the, this is the biggest sages of our generation all signed this. The Gdolei Aposkim saying, dresses and skirts must be at least four inches, which is ten centimeters, below the lowest point of the kneecap to guarantee that the knees will be covered 
at all times. Sometimes even more is required according to a, uh, a Rabbi Gaon Shlomo Zalman. One of Gdolei Ado, Zalman Oerbach. The rest of this was signed by him, signed by a Gaon Arav, Yosef Shalom Ilyashiv, Zatzal, uh, Rav uh, uh, Shmuel Levi Wasner, and obviously uh, Rav Falk in his book, and Rav uh, Moshe Feinstein, all of the Gdolei Adol agreed at what modesty is. So how could there be that some rabbis out there are not saying anything about this. They see women coming to shul with their immodesty, with their mini skirts, like they go into a club. You know, on Yom Kippur, the people that come to the Knesset once a year, they don't come to the Knesset ready to pray. They come to the Knesset ready to show off. Show off the new watch, show off the plastic surgery, show off the money, show off. Why doesn't anybody say anything? Because we're all more scared of people than we are of Hashem. In the book, Ahavat HaChaim, it was a very scary story. This book, right behind me. Ahavat HaChaim. Ahavat HaChaim. Sorry. Ahavat HaChaim. Ahavat HaChaim. It's a very, very scary but true story. It was one time of a few merchants traveling from uh, city to city, and on their way home, they passed by a um, the woods. And all of a sudden, from the woods, they hear screaming. And they go through the woods, and they see a house. And they hear a screaming of two women an older woman and a little kid coming out of this house. By the way, this story may give you nightmares. So if you're scared, this is the part you might want to put mute. It's a true story. So the merchants go and look into the house and they see something unnatural. They see an older woman, who apparently is the mother, next to her young little girl. Maybe six, seven, eight years old. And the mom, and they're both next to a bathtub, but the bathtub has boiling hot water where you see the bubbles and the smoke coming out of it. And the mom digs her hand into the water and takes out clothes, burning her hands, making blood come out of her hands, that's how hot it is, and takes out the clothes and puts it on the daughter, burning the daughter's skin. And both of them are screaming at the same time, and she continues doing this over and over again. Is like a never-ending supply of clothes in this bathtub. And she keeps doing it. And the people got so damaged by it mentally, they ran away. They went to their Rav. They ran away back to their city, which was close by. And they went to their Rav, which was a big Mekubal. A real Mekubal. Not like today's people call themselves Mekubalim. And Rav says, what, you just left her there? Let's go get it. Let's go, go save this kid. They go. There's no house. There's no kid. There's no mom. There's nothing. It's gone. Matter of hours later, it's all gone. There's nothing. There's no sign it ever existed. There's no, more than one person. There's a handful of people that saw this. So the rabbi made a special prayer asking for Hashem for an answer, went to sleep, and he got the answer in, his, uh, in a dream. 
And one of the sages that came to his dream says, yes, those uh, merchant received the schut to see what happens in Shamayim as a punishment to a mother who does not dress her daughter modestly. This is what she has to do in Gehenom. Shemirachem. Not my story. It's a book published, very, very famous book, Avat Chaim. So now, we know what modesty is. We know what we need to do. 